Um, well, let me introduce uh, the panel to you in the order that you're going to be hearing um, from them. So over here we have Dr. Sarah Heyerman, who's Assistant Professor at the London School of Economics and Political Sciences European Institute. Sarah's held research and policy positions in Brussels, Copenhagen and London, and she's published really extensively on transparency, accountability and the role of national parliaments in the EU. So I think she's going to be able to give us a really rich perspective today. Um, sitting here is my colleague Darren Hughes, who's a former New Zealand Member of Parliament and he's now the Deputy Chief Executive um, with the ERS. And Darren's sort of ranged far and wide over the whole sort of democratic reform agenda that we cover at the ERS, but one of the things he's really led on is um, the, the decision we made as an organisation to actually engage really thoughtfully and constructively, not just on e UK democratic institutions, but actually the relationship between the UK and EU institutions um, as well, and, and um, has done some terrific work on that. Um, Bernard Jenkin, I'm sure you all know, is the Member of Parliament for Harwich and North Essex, um, one of the 1992 Maastricht rebels. He's presently Chairman of the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee, which is holding an inquiry into the conduct of the upcoming EU referendum. And then over here we have um, Peter Wilding, who I'm sure you all know as well, founder and director of British Influence, organisation conducting campaigns and research on the UK's continued membership of the EU, believing that that makes us a stronger, more secure, more influential and richer country. So as I said, I think we're going to have a really robust and lively um, debate this evening. Um, just a couple of kind of words of, of introduction. As I said, you, you'll have been, it's such a hot topic. You'll have been to many, many discussions about this. And I guess the question is what's going to be a little bit different about this this evening's discussion, what's the terrain we're going to cover. I guess we feel that, that a lot of the coverage and the discussion of the government's renegotiation has rightly focused on the economic pros and cons and, and some of the other aspects of the current EU rules. There's been less focus perhaps on the existing democratic deficit, that remoteness that so many people feel from EU institutions. And I think wherever people are on the kind of in, out, unsure spectrum, I just think that's something that, that, that almost everybody would recognise. There's a, a big gulf between people and formal party politics in this country. And then I think you take the gap that a lot of people would say they felt about EU institutions, even if they knew what those were. And I think that's something that a lot of people sense. And I hope it's that democratic deficit that we're really going to kind of delve into um, today. Some of the questions we should be exploring, are the, um, are the institutions beyond repair? Or can they be improved and connect people and, crucially, parliaments, both Westminster, the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly, um, with those institutions once more? A bigger role for national parliaments is obviously one of the things that must be on David Cameron's shopping list, but what does that actually mean? And I hope we can actually kind of explore some of that in concrete terms. It's, it's a good sort of um, banner, isn't it? But what does it actually mean in practice? Um, uh, one of, uh, lots of this we looked at in a report which um, was authored by my colleague Chris Terry, who's sitting here in the front row, it's called Close the Gap tackling Europe's democratic deficit. And one of the things that um, Darren will do is take us through actually some, some of the kind of practical recommendations that we make in that report for closing the gap and having an increased role for national parliaments. Some of the other questions we might want to think about are how to tackle the perception of European elections as, as a fundamentally second order election. What about green cards, red cards, are there other measures for strengthening the role of the National Parliament? And again, Wales and Scotland need to be part of that as well. And obviously, as the Electoral Reform Society, you would expect me at least to touch on the question of whether a different electoral system should be used for MEPs. Should there be one that's more open and less subject to central party control, which again, I think is something that people coming from all different angles um, can feel strongly about. There'll be many other questions as well. I hope we'll all sort of find fresh angles and interests um, this evening on, on this extremely hot topic. So um, I'm now going to turn to our first speaker. Um, I'm going to be very strict on time and give our speakers up to six minutes because I want to make sure it's a real discussion and debate involving all of you. So Sarah, delighted to have you and over to you now. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation to come here. I'd like to just touch on, on a couple of uh, broader issues first because of course this is a very hot topic in Britain but with great implications for other European countries as well. The EU membership for the UK is followed very closely by the other capitals, of course, 
And at LSE, where I'm um, based, we are just at the moment publishing uh, a big research project that looks at the reactions to Cameron's uh, points for renegotiation and proposals for reform the European Union and how that is met in the capitals. And just to highlight a couple <coughs> of those issues that we see from the capitals, which is that um, everyone have a feeling that reform of the EU is needed, partly because of this perception of a democratic <coughs> deficit uh, that you mentioned, and that I'll get into a couple of those points in a, in a second. But as such, the message from the UK to wanting a reformed EU is not an unwelcome one. What is unwelcome, though, is that at the moment there's been a feeling that the UK has not, in its discussion, in its dialogue with counterparts, been very sensitive to a number of issues from their um, uh, country positions. One is that, as in the UK, the governments in European countries um, at the moment uh, experience a huge pressure from opposition parties. This is maybe mainstream opposition parties, but it is also the rise in extremist parties that we have seen across Europe. So a lot of governments at the moment are hesitant to table a renegotiation with a key EU member state as an option that will lead them to face the same kind of pressure at home and perhaps even lose their governmental powers in the upcoming elections. So the debate is a difficult one, not just here in the UK, but also one with great implications for government opposition dynamics across Europe. Um, the other issue I wanted to mention from uh, the capitals is that, as you've said, Katie, um, here in the UK, we often have the debate framed as an economic one. Is it in our economic interest to be part of the union? For most of the EU member states, we should not forget that this is about geopolitics, perhaps even more than economic benefits at the moment. And with everything that is going on in <coughs> our neighborhood of Europe, this is increasingly so a top priority. Any of the Eastern European countries will be concerned with the security and the dialogue with Russia <coughs> if the UK was to leave and not take into consideration those concerns, that would be a huge loss to their minds. So those were the two main, main messages I think we can take from capitals across Europe, and there's a lot more being published right now on the Europe, LSE Europe uh, uh, politics website on this. <coughs> but also, of course, the context that we are in right now is quite different to when Mr. Cameron announced the intention to have a referendum on the EU, both economically and in terms of a migration and geopolitical situation in Europe. And um, I have in my own research shown that the uh, UK uh, has very close allies in its policy making. For example, in the Council, the UK is closely positioned on almost all policy areas with a coalition of, let's call them liberal, progressive um, countries, um, the Scandinavian countries, the Dutch, uh, Estonian, uh, Czech at times, uh, really form a fairly stable coalition on a number of uh, policy areas in the council. We see the same thing happen in the European Parliament where the MEPs vote on EU policies as well. And hence, we should not think about the UK and them. Mm -hmm. We need to think about the UK and then what's going on in this big diverse group of European counterparts. And again, I don't think that that's so, re so much reflected in the domestic debate here, but I think that it's worthwhile highlighting that a number of countries in Europe are very much looking to the UK as an ally, open to reform, on a number of issues that they are also concerned about and that they hope that this big brother, because they are mainly small and medium-sized countries, would actually be able to, to play a, a, a key role in, in a, a true reform process. Now, 
I would like to, point to then point out just a few issues that are highlighted uh, also in this report, uh, but also, of course, by Mr. Cameron in his uh, reform proposal, which is like this uh, sense of a democratic deficit in the EU. And in particular, there is a number of, of proposals, formally and informally, of how to tackle that. Um, to my mind, some of them are, are very good proposals. Most of them can be overcome without a treaty change. Um, others are, are more difficult. But I think that what is really key to highlight here is that we already have a representative system at national level that is there to represent the interests of citizens of national parliaments in Brussels. And there are various channels for that, and they are already very developed. So the, question, the key point that has been highlighted is the need for taking back powers to national parliaments. Now, if I may be very blunt, and you can tell I'm not British from my accent, mm. I'm from <laughs> Denmark, we have a very different parliamentary system. And the observation from most researchers engaged with the kind of scrutiny you have in the UK and across Europe is that the parliament is not very involved mm. in EU affairs in the UK. But that's not due to the EU. That's due to internal procedures and practices here in the UK. So I think that it's worthwhile um, taking a strong uh, look, and I'm sure that that's what will be highlighted now, that actually there are a lot of improvements that can already be made um, within the existing uh, setup that we have for the national parliaments. Of course, we can consider new initiatives such as a red card, yellow card, green card system, but all in all, <coughs> there's already strong channels in place for, being, for the parliament to being involved, having an input into government positions, into MEP positions in uh, Brussels, and they are not fully exploited as it is. Great. Thanks very much, sorry, and I'm going to hand um, a warm round of applause. Very nice. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Sarah. I hope we can come back to many of those points in, in discussion. That was a fantastic start, and I'm going to hand over to Darren Hughes now. Great. Thanks, Katie. Uh, obviously, uh, there's been three days now of party conference uh, fringe events on, on Europe, so if you're interested in this topic, there's been lots of things to, to go through. And I, I think from, from an ERS point of view, a, a democracy organization that's been going for over 130 years. Uh, wh what we're keen to look at is what are some of the practical things that can be done to address uh, the democratic deficit regardless of our view on remain or stay. So as an organization we take no position on, on that but we, we just look at the set of policy settings that are in front of uh, in front of us from an EU perspective and say uh, what does need to, need to change. And I think what's really interesting about that is that how power is distributed and how democracy works is on the forefront of many of the discussions uh, right across the UK at the moment, most spectacularly uh, last autumn uh, in Scotland, but also since the return of the government uh, in May, cities and devolution deals, how councils work, how uh, power is distributed from Whitehall to Town Hall. So th there's, a lot of a dis there's a lot of discussion uh, about how best uh, power should be used, and our concern was that when it comes to the European Union, people have uh, very strong, um, uh, almost reactive uh, political opinions. They're either for it or they're against it. Uh, uh, and our focus has been to say, how can you try and make this about democracy as well as the very important and legitimate economic issues? So most of the fringe events that have been on the conference over the last three days have ta tackled those economic issues and what, what um, I'm keen to talk about in my contribution are, are some of the democracy elements, the citizen-led elements uh, that, that we think uh, need to be addressed uh, and, and could offer uh, some change regardless of the outcome of the, uh, of the referendum. Now we have 12 of these uh, recommendations and uh, it's in the, in the report that is on your seat, Close the Gap. And Close the Gap was the language we wanted to use to say there is a problem and here are some ideas to try and bring uh, bring that gap together. And I think that it is worth pointing out uh, that uh, subsidiarity 
a, a difficult uh, a word and even harder concept to understand, does seem to us to chime with the, with the kind of conversations that are now happening uh, in, in the UK. So uh, we, we, we take that as our starting point. How, how do we get people to feel more involved, more committed, more uh, of a sense of, uh, of connection to decisions that are taken at European level which affect the lives of millions of people? Now, only, only the, uh, the Danish people have uh, a, a view uh, by majority that their voice counts in Europe. Uh, most, pe most European citizens do not believe their voice counts, and, and, the, and the UK is, <coughs> at the, is at the top of that chain, uh, and the other countries that surround uh, that group are people who have had to go through very difficult uh, austerity decisions. So actually, uh, the UK sort of sits out on its own in terms of not getting a democratic connection. So, so we've come up with some recommendations which cover what the UK Parliament should do, what the Commission should do, what the European Parliament uh, should look to change, and then also taking into account the practicality of politics, what, what parties can be doing uh, as, as well to try and re-engage the public. So I just want to, um, uh, to, to, to run, run through those now. First of all, starting on, on what, what Sarah said, we, we strongly believe that this notion of, of green cards and red cards uh, should be uh, beefed up and added to in addition to the kind of yellow card system that, that, that exists at the moment. And, and the, the critical thing there is in giving national parliaments uh, a, a sense of responsibility for the, the laws that their citizens have to live under, even though, they, even though these are decisions taken and decided upon in Europe. Just because they're not taken at Westminster doesn't mean that Westminster politicians shouldn't intervene, shouldn't have a view, shouldn't uh, have a way of communicating uh, this to the public. So we, we, we very much believe that the adoption of green cards would be uh, a, a very positive step. And in a very, again, keeping with our practical uh, aim, uh, we also believe that the consultation period for that should be massively increased from what it is now to allow, to allow the Parliament the chance to reflect and then contribute to uh, decisions that are taken uh, at, at uh, Europe. And we, we think that should be around three months uh, between uh, decision and uh, the issuing uh, of, a, of a green card. We, we also think there's a much stronger uh, parliamentary role for scrutiny of the executive around council decision meetings, so that when the UK executive, the cabinet, the government, uh, go and, uh, and take a position in Europe, there should be some pre-scrutiny uh, by the legislature uh, of the position that the government <coughs> takes, and we think there'd be a, uh, a lot of interest uh, and a lot of value uh, that, could, uh, that, that could come from that. And secondly, sorry, the third thing about the parliament is that uh, it, Europe should not be an add-on. Uh, we, we need to mainstream the work of the parliamentary select committee system so that in addition to all of its work scrutinising the decisions of Whitehall uh, departments and Whitehall ministers, uh, that, that they're also taking into account the decisions that are being made for citizens at a European level. So mainstreaming the work of our select committee system to take into account European decisions uh, we think would be uh, a, a very important uh, step to take and, and actually in fairness to the much maligned House of Lords, actually is something uh, that, that they are doing uh, much better, we think, than the House of Commons uh, at the moment. We think from a PR point of view, uh, public relations, not proportional representation, uh, we think that it would be good to have a speakers conference where the European democracy issues could be highlighted so for, for people to get an understanding of, of just how critical these topics are. We think there hasn't been the kind of conversation between citizen and parliament uh, on European issues that, that you'd expect to have. So we, we think that would be uh, a very good thing to do. And then finally, uh, there is a huge gap uh, in, the devolved, in the devolved parliaments, the devolved governments, where there are ministers who take day-to-day -day decisions about the, the lives and the policy areas of people in Wales and Scotland, uh, but actually don't have a connection back to UK-level consultation at European level. And, and as, as there's more devolution to the nations and to the cities, that's going to become much more of an issue. R I'm running very short on time, so I just want to say uh, uh, three uh, quick final points about the Parliament. One is we think there should be a proportional voting system for uh, MEPs. We, we, we think that the current system gives too much power to the parties, and it means that millions of people don't know who their MEPs are. At least if there was a candidate-centred system like STV for the, for the European Parliament, uh, that would be uh, a, a much more useful. Uh, on the Commission, we don't believe there should be any rowing back on the candidate model for selecting a president, warts and all problems that we know that there are, but there does need to be uh, a, a, a democratic connection there 
uh, we, we should advance and not retreat from it and we should reduce the size of the Commission and our report sets out maybe having senior and junior commissioners as the uh, EU uh, expands. Very, very finally, on, on what political parties can do, it's critical that they become more diverse in the uh, representation they offer uh, from the pool of MEPs. We need far many more women, but we also need far many more political opinions about Europe. It can't all just be that the people in various political parties that support Europe go into the MEP wing of their party and then just love Europe and speak about all this. We need to make sure that actually MEPs are, have that pan-European view uh, across the party. So uh, hopefully you can uh, read our report, 12 recommendations in there about how we could make European democracy stronger uh, by, by involving more citizens. <coughs> Thank you. Great. Thanks, Darren. Excellent. Thanks very much, Darren, especially for, for keeping it sort of really practical. Great. Um, now, delighted to welcome Bernard Jenkins to speak. Thank you, Katie. Um, Darren mentioned that um, this, uh, this debate about Europe is very polarizing. It's either for or against. And I'm rather, I, I have to confess, I'm rather sad that we're having such a polarized debate because uh, whatever happens in this, we're going to be living next door to our European neighbors and we're going to need to get on with them. And it would have been better to have um, a more honest and open conversation about what we want to change with our European partners rather than this rather artificial deadline that the Prime Minister set himself. I was always in favor of renegotiation and redefining our relationship. Um, and I fear what's happening in this renegotiation is expectations have been raised and they will be dashed. Mm. And, uh, um, and, and actually, th there are about 40% of the electors out there at the moment who are probably pretty fluid on this question. And um, uh, um, I fear that they're, well, I, I, I expect that they're the ones that are going to decide the outcome and they will vote to leave because they will be so disappointed. There are economic arguments, and yes, they tend to predominate because people think about their financial and economic security. There are the security and geopolitical arguments. And I'm, I've no doubt that um, um, we can be as reassuring as anybody on, these, on those two arguments. But the, the fundamental question is the dem democracy argument. I really welcome this opportunity to talk about the democratic deficit in the EU. And Darren mentions the word subsidiarity. This was introduced into the treaties in Maastricht, and I remember being assured by Tristan Garrell Jones, the Europe Minister at the time, this was going to you know, transform the way the European Court thought about its rulings. And the, there were signs that the centralizing tendencies of the court were going to go into reverse. And, and uh, Douglas Hurd told us that um, no longer would the EU interfere in the nooks and crannies of our daily lives. Well, I mean, and nothing could have been more um, misleading of the truth. And um, if we're thinking about our democratic deficit, Let's first of all ask us what democracy is. The democracy is the right to make your own laws and to choose your own rulers. And the European Union, the European Union is a huge attempt to redefine who is them and who is us. Now, if we were going to live in a democracy in which uh, was a European democracy, uh, a, a, a transnational democracy, where uh, we are all going to vote in elections and perhaps have an, a, a, an elected president of the European Union answerable to the elected parliament of the European Union, and this was going to be our democracy. Um, and that could actually work. But there is absolutely no sign whatsoever that any of the nations of the European Union will regard that as their country. I mean, this is just a completely artificial construct. In Europe, democracy is a national endeavor. It is a national thing, which is why David, David Cameron was absolutely right to put into his uh, Bloomberg speech uh, the line about national parliaments. He said, it is national parliaments which are the source of democracy and legitimacy in the European Union. Sure. And um, I'm afraid anything, sh anything short of restoring the individual right of national parliaments to de determine the degree to which they are it, that their nations are integrated into the European Union on a daily basis is a negation of democratic accountability. The reason why the British public are so disengaged from the European Union is not because political parties aren't doing this or we haven't got this voting system or um, the, the procedure of the, conserv of, the, of the House of Commons to scrutinize European legislation isn't slightly different. It is absolutely fundamental that the British people hold their national governments account accountable 
for what happens in, their, in, in the United Kingdom. And they will blame or sack or reward the national governments for what occurs. And um, um, let's just look at something that's been happening today. There has been a ruling of the European Court of, Hu of, uh, European Court of Justice on the question of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Now, Tony Blair told us that the Charter of Fundamental Rights in the Lisbon Treaty was going to have as much significance as the Beano. Um, it has since become apparent, and, and he negotiated an opt-out for us. It was a protocol at the end of the treaty that effectively made it clear that this was not to apply to the United Kingdom or to Poland, incidentally. The, the European Court of Justice has just completely ignored this protocol. And today, I mean, prisoner voting is a, is a very emotive subject. The and uh, and the, result I, the, the result is, if the, the tight, um, <coughs> you look at the actual ruling, and they have taken the, they reserve themselves the right to rule on the proportionality uh, of the question of to how long prisoners are denied the right to vote, uh, which means that this matter is now in the purview of the European Court of Justice. This isn't the human convention. This isn't the European Convention of Human Rights. This is the European Court of Justice, which a, a British judge said. Um, the, fundamental, the Charter of Fundamental Rights comprises a far broader suite of rights than we've already subscribed to in the European Convention through the Human Rights Act. And um, this is uh, uh, why the Prime Minister in the 2010 manifesto included a line that he wanted a complete opt-out from the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Well, that's not even being negotiated now. It's not even a question he's raising in the negotiations. So there is part of the democratic deficit. But the most fundamental problem we've got, we're going to be told, you know, it's, it's, in this referendum, the choice is, are you going to maintain the status quo and stay in, or are you going to take this terrible risk and leave? I'm afraid there is no status quo option in this referendum. Uh, the reason is because uh, the Eurozone is going to have to develop and deepen and intensify very significantly if there is a chance of the Euro, the Euro actually functioning as a proper currency. Fiscal union, um, uh, banking union, um, a, a, a European Treasury. It's been set out in a report called the Five Presidents Report, and they actually finish up by saying, of course, it's about political union, which is what we always said European and monetary union was about. The problem is, even if we are not subscribed explicitly to uh, um, these arrangements ourselves, there is only one set of EU treaties. There is only one set of EU institutions. There's only one body of EU law. And just as the European Court of Justice has decided, for example, that the, the, uh, that the um, working time directive is a health and safety matter, they, w they will decide, for example, that the uh, financial transactions tax is a single market measure. Remember, in the, in the, Euro in the, in the American Constitution, uh, it is the Commerce Clause that provides the entire basis of federal power yeah. across, uh, in domestic politics across the United States. And it is this single market clause that is always used as the pretext for ever more interference in the, in the affairs of member states. Even internal affairs of member states have got nothing. I mean, actually, prisoner voting, what's it got to do with the single market? But nevertheless, that is the mentality of the court. The only, democ the only way that democracy can be restored is if the, um, m the member states themselves who choose to have it can have a veto over what applies in their own countries that this is a true, uh, presumably we want the European Union to be a consensual union, one that, w a, 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 a union of consent, not of legal coercion. But we are being included into a union of legal coercion. And if we don't want that, we're going to have to vote to leave. And if the Prime Minister can't obtain for us, for example, the right of our national parliament to decide how much we pay to the European Union, how we control our borders and immigration, um, and uh, um, what laws apply in our own country, well then, this is not a un union we can be a member of any longer. And being outside need hold no fears for this country. It, there will be great opportunities for leaving the European Union. It will be setting our relationship on what the Prime Minister wants, a relationship with our European partners based on trade and cooperation, not European centralization. If they can't accommodate, accommodate our wishes, then we will have to set uh, a new relationship ba based on on being outside the existing treaties. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks very much, um, Bernard. And finally, we're going to hear from Peter Wilding. <coughs> the 
reason why the British people are disengaged from uh, politics is the democratic deficit in the UK. So I'm going to completely countermand <coughs> and challenge my good friend Bernard Jenkins' basic precept. First of all, I think he's a great man. And Brutus was an honorable man. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, the democratic deficit that I'm talking about is the fact that Bernard is not doing his job. And the reason I'm saying Bernard is not doing his job, go on, I haven't even started yet. <laughs> Give me a break. And the reason by Bernard, and I would let, let's just make it a little bit more exciting. All right? Now, the reason Bernard is not doing his job, as he talks about the Sinn Féin approach to um, national independence, ourselves alone, is because we don't live in the world that Bernard is talking about. National independence, the absolute irrevocable control of our policy, is not something that is current and applicable in the modern world. Nor did Churchill think so in 1945 when he sent British lawyers to write the original European Convention of Human Rights because he believed that the modern world was not going to be based on war, it was going to be based on law. And the values that we have in this country, the values of democracy and freedom under rule of law, were values that he wanted to extend. Never forget that democracy ended at Dover in 1940. And now it is being fought over in Donetsk in the Ukraine, in no small measure, due to the influence of this country in getting international and supranational institutions in the modern world to apply laws that other nations themselves apply. Now, this is the world we live in. And if you doubt that, if you think we want a future where we're going to be Norway with nukes or a Singapore on steroids, then listen to this. Yesterday, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was signed. That is a free trade deal between the United States and the Southeast Asian countries to represent what the World Trade Organization, remember, an option for the outers is to get our seat back in the World Trade Organization. You know, an organization which hasn't made a deal in the best part of 25, 30 years. The world today is regionalizing. Power is regional. In fact, let's just be clear about it. Business is global. Power is regional. Politics is local. Statesmen will be able to join the dots in order to ensure that the public understands the world isn't as it was. And Britain's responsibility in democratic terms, which I shall come to in a second, is to make sure that our value system is spread as far and wide across the world as we can. And the European Union is a vehicle to do that. <laughs> ah, you laugh. And the people who laugh, of course, who think the European Union is some kind of new USSR, a diktat, a system of dictatorship, which, yeah. Well, let me say, ladies and gentlemen, you're suffering what I call a narcissistic victim syndrome. And the reason I'm telling you that <laughs> is because Sarah made the point which you are faintly and strangely ignoring, and that Britain has substantial power in Europe. The two greatest achievements of the European Union over the last 30 years are the single market and the enlargement of a space of democracy, freedom, and the rule of law to the borders of Russia. I absolutely don't understand why you're choking at that. Do you honestly believe the Polish people believe they're living in an un undemocratic state? Do you, leave when the, do you believe when the Polish foreign minister, previous foreign minister, Radek Sikorski, said, you both are mad. Britain, uh, Europe is an English-speaking power. The French now say of Europe that they're living Europe anglais. And why do they say that? Because Britain, relentlessly, since it came to the membership of the European Union, has pursued a policy of opening borders to trade. And Bernard's future, of the glorious future of the piratical buccaneering Elizabethan state 
if he wants us to go back to it. Ah, you see. Let me just tell you our greatest days. Nigel Farage will love you. <laughs> Nigel Farage keeps on saying he wants to take our country back. I want to take our country forward, sir. And you've got to realize, if you want to take our country forward, you've got to understand what the reality of how the world operates today. So when I said about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, next year, fingers crossed, we will consolidate the greatest free trade agreement ever between Europe and the United States. Now you will all bang on about, well Bernard will, bang on about how trade doesn't require <coughs> us to be members of the European Union. But then Bernard is living in a world of John Bright and Richard Crob Cobden, the people in the 19th century who said free trade will abolish <coughs> war. But trade is about politics. Try selling stuff to China. That's not a free trading zone. Thank you. <laughs> Damn. It was quite exciting while it lasted. But let me finish off. The democratic deficit in the UK needs to be addressed. Look, the EU is not perfect by any sense of the No conservative in this room is, old, is going to fly the flag to the European Union and say it's a great sort of, uh, institution. But nor is the United Nations, nor is the World Bank, nor is the IMF, nor is FIFA. But let's be honest about it, our defense policy is affected by our membership of NATO. Our foreign policy is affected by our membership of the United Nations, and we can't abolish the offside rule because we are members of FIFA. We are members of international institutions, and we are powerful members of international institutions. So let me finish. It was Churchill who wanted Britain to play a vivid role in a international world order based on law. We have done that. And I will say this in my conclusion. The Danish parliament, of which Sarah mentioned earlier on, is a perfect example of how to do it right. Members of parliament representing their constituents mandate their ministers to go to Brussels and there is absolute transparency. That's why the Danish public feel informed and educated about what's going on. <laughs> in the UK Parliament, members of Parliament know nothing about what's going on in Europe. The only person in control of European policy in the, in the standing committees of the House of Commons is Bill Cash. <laughs> Hardly an impartial figure. <laughs> I would like us to go to a truly transparent democratic system where Bernard knows what he's talking about. And that's because he would be abs he wouldn't be moaning about European law, he would be changing European law. That's what we don't do in this parliament. And that's what we can't do. We can. Why do you say that? Because frankly, the United Kingdom, especially in its uh, in its in its policy on the single market, has achieved so much that you would little dream of. And the fact is, what is out like? Because the ultimate democratic <coughs> deficit, sir, is out. Because we want to be in the single market, but we will have no control of the laws made in the single market. And I would, I would finish off by saying, go back to the American Revolution. No regulation without representation should be our motto in this coming referendum. Because frankly, if you want power, and if you want democracy, leaving is no way to do, no way to do it. Thank you. Great.